You're gonna need a bigger boat. to another episode of the show. We are your hosts, Colin Peters here. Jeff Manfred. John Rochetta, how's it going? And today we are going to be talking about a very special classic back from the 70s. I believe this movie came out in 1975. And that is Steven Spielberg's Jaws. The first blockbuster ever. <laughs> Summer blockbuster. Summer blockbuster. At least to coin the term blockbuster. <laughs> This is uh, the movie that put Steven Spielberg on the map. It stars Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss. They are the three main characters, as well as Bruce the Shark. <laughs> is his name Bruce? The, yes. the shark's name is Bruce. It I didn't know after that. Steven Spielberg's lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that's why uh, Finding Nemo, the big great white. Oh Bruce. my god, that's too funny. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Little throwbacks like that just make everything even more hilarious. <laughs> so, to kick things off, just to let everybody know, Jaws is actually based off of a book that came out, written by author Peter Benchley. And the movie is its own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some major differences, like the the main characters kind of overtake the, the threat of the shark, really. It's yeah. just kind of there in the mm -hmm. book. Yeah. And it kind of, I guess, puts everybody together. And the book, the, the characters really aren't likable at all. There's a lot of things that go on with the characters, especially with um, Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss. He actually has an affair with Roy Schneider's wife in yes. the book. Crap. Yeah, there's yeah. an affair that goes on. Yeah. And Hooper actually, spoiler, Hooper dies in the book. He is actually eaten by the shark. Yeah, um, Lorraine Gary plays Ellen Brody. That is... Roy Scheider's character's wife. Roy Scheider plays Martin Brody. And he's a police chief on Amity Island, which... Um, it, where, where's Amity supposed to be? Amity in, Island. in Boston? It takes place in New York. Mm -hmm. And Lorraine Gray was actually married to the chief of Universal Studios at the time. Oh, yeah, because they thought they... Um, it was like favoritism or something. Favoritism, all, yeah. She, she was actually married to the president of Universal at the time, and then she stayed with all the other movies. And they said she was actually a solid actor, and that's oh, yeah. why they, mm -hmm. they let her on. She was like the only one to stay with the sequels. She I was. Else yeah. Came back except for what? And in the second one? Jaws 4 was her last movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was her last movie ever, I think, too. <laughs> ever? Oh, wow. I think ever. <laughs> well, after that, I don't know. I mean, and yeah, that train wreck, I mean, yeah. I don't blame her. And, and just think, Michael Caine is in... Jaws the Revenge. That was one of his paycheck movies. Yeah. Like, like the swarm. He just, he wanted to do this movie because he just wanted to buy a house. Yeah. <laughs> I have not seen Jaws the Revenge, but I have seen the house it bought. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. Should we just dive into the synopsis? Yeah, go, um, yeah. Jeff, John, whichever one of you guys want to take. I think I'll figure out a sign. Jeff okay. does. All right. <laughs> But yeah, Jaws the movie it came out in 1975. This was known as the first blockbuster. People actually lined up around the block outside the movie theater just to get an admission ticket to see this film. And it was a huge hit when it came out. It was Spielberg's second movie. He kind of had like an audition movie with the film Duel. And that got a lot of studios' attention because that was actually a TV movie, Duel. But then it actually got so much popularity on TV that actually got a limited theatrical release. Oh, wow. Oh, I and didn't know that. It did get a theatrical release for a limited time, and because of that movie's success in the small time, he was able to um, convince studios to be the director for Jaws. And there were very big similarities between Duel and Jaws, too. Mm -hmm, exactly. Like, how he successfully made Duel, um, the truck being almost like the monster. Like, the face of the truck is like a monster. And then it was this very suspenseful cat and mouse game. And it was back and forth, some really great adrenaline pumping stuff for a movie that came out in the 70s. And like Duel, making the truck an entity, he made a shark, a great white shark, an entity. 
And this movie, um, there is a book that was written about it, and I think it was based off of a situation that took place with a bull shark. Because um, it originally happened where there was an incident that took place, I'm not sure exactly where, but I think it was out, I could be wrong, the Mississippi River, where a bull shark attack actually killed several people, and it was setting the town in a huge frenzy that they didn't know what exactly was going on, and more people started losing their lives until they finally realized the nature of the shark, and they put it down, and then it kind of sparked the interest of a book. And I, I think that's what led to Jaws, but they changed it to a great white to make it more menacing because a great white is twice the size of a bull shark. I had heard uh, Peter Benchley tell a story that I guess they not found an attack, but I think there was they just caught a, a great white shark that was like 25 feet, mm-hmm. over 2,000 pounds. Yeah. And he said, yeah, and I think it was in New Jersey or, some, or maybe, maybe in New York. I don't remember for sure, but... There's a lot of things that people kind of take claim, like, we, this incident started Jaws, or this incident started Jaws. It's kind of like going back and forth. (laughs) Like, my dad's better than your dad. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But, but yeah, I remember him telling a story, at least just, if not an attack, just that this huge shark existed, and he said, wow, what if, you know, like, one of these came in, terrorized the town, and just wouldn't go away? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So then, the, really, the, the premise of this movie, Jaws, is very simple. There is a huge shark attack that takes place. A girl loses her life in the, in the opening 10 minutes of the movie. She goes out for a swim, and then you hear, once again, we're talking about John Williams. I mean, he's the guy, the amazing guy. This is one of his, I would say, top three scores of all time because it's so iconic. It's referenced in everything. Just the dun dum dun dum and you really don't I mean the audience already knows it has to be a shark because of the poster they have to know what it is but Spielberg does a great job in the opening scene of just like not letting you know or even see the shark you just see the panning up through the water the girl being dragged in she's freaking out and then she dies she's killed by the shark attack and the town is kind of trying to keep this under wraps because even though somebody just died on their beach and then there are smaller instances that are occurring, um, another child then eventually loses his life in the movie and then Chief Brody is trying to figure out what exactly is happening here because they're convinced that this is now a shark attack. And Hooper, who is the marine biologist, is convinced that this shark is not done. They actually stage a manhunt to go after the shark and they catch a shark, which is revealed to be a tiger shark. And he makes the claim, because there are hundreds of species of sharks out there in the water, and the chance of anyone finding the right one is slim to none. And so it really just becomes a giant hunt for this great white shark, and it puts these three characters, Roy Scheider, who plays Chief Brody, um, Richard Dreyfus, who plays Matt Hooper, the marine biologist, and Robert Shaw, who plays a character known as Quint, who has a very rich backstory, and we'll get into that later. But these three are basically then hired to go out in a boat called the Orca to hunt and kill this great white shark that's terrorizing this town. The mayor is trying to keep this under wraps because he wants people to go out and have a a celebration. On He wants the people to take in the sun, the weather, the beach, the culture, and everything, well, as even mayor, though people are dying. He relies on the, the summer dollars to fuel the town's economy. Exactly. That's, that's, this, this is a beach town. This is a town that thrives on beach culture and people going out, enjoying the water. But this movie made people afraid to go in the water. especially oh, my, sure. Especially myself when I first saw this movie. It is... <laughs> I'd say plus it takes place over Fourth of July week, so it's true. Yeah, so that's when obviously the most money is going to come in for him. So I could see why the mayor did it, but he still did a shitty job at you know protecting the people. He really did <laughs> because he was looking out for his ass. He was looking out for just like his public appearance and just I guess he was in denial. He was in a, really in a lot of denial about how this could be happening to his community. I don't and, even think it was denial. I think it was just like he didn't care. Like he really comes across as, I got an economy to worry about. With right, this town. I'm I'm looking out for myself, and I guess, yeah, maybe it wasn't really denial because his family was kind of on the beach. He makes a a point in the script saying my kids were on that beach too. I'm mm-hmm. a little freaked out too, but then the real core of the story is those three characters out in the Atlantic Ocean hunting down this shark, which is crazy because there are, there I don't know how many sharks there are on the planet right now, but there are species hundreds of species that exist and like they caught the first tiger shark um 
the chances of them finding the one is very slim to none, but they're convinced that this is a super predator. This is a great white because of the bite radius and they gutted the tiger shark and they found nothing because the shark has already claimed the life of the girl, the boy that was killed on the raft. And it sends this whole town into paranoia, but it's really about these three characters and um, their hunt for survival. And that's kind of really what the main premise of this movie is. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. But like any like movie, you think that this would be about the shark. It really isn't about the shark. It's about the characters. And that's what the sequels got wrong. They just wanted to see the shark. Sure. Yeah. And, that, and you can kind of say that kind of goes into the failed production. Because this movie, like a lot of other movies that you think would fail, but actually succeeded... It was a because nightmare to make. It was a nightmare to make. The mechanical shark was failing. Um, they couldn't get the right shots. And there are a couple shots where you actually... They have a shark. They actually utilized a real shark in some of the scenes. In deep which is, sea dive. Well, not, deep, maybe not deep sea diving, but... The cage. Di- the cage, yeah. the cage, cage scene at the very end. That was a real shark at one point. But... They think they originally were supposed to shoot from May to June. And then it went all the way to September. Like... Yeah, August they, or September. The, the length of the production went way over, and they were supposed to have this film done, and it was still going on. And that was creating a lot of distress with the people involved in the production, and this was like a director's like his first big project, and just going from there. But they originally wanted the shark to appear much more in this movie, but it's almost kind of a strength that it doesn't because. The main focus is really on the characters. There's just a shark. That's kind of the icing on the cake. And when the shark appears, he appears. And you feel it. It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Especially when you just get little glimpses of him. Just gliding under the water and just sends chills down your spine. At least it did for me and a lot of other people as well. Dude, the music kind of became the shark in a way. Too. The music was... Yeah, it, yeah. Definitely had a big, like, a big part in it. Originally, Steven Spielberg thought that was a joke that John Williams did. Yes. Really? Yeah. He said it was, it was too funny to fit it until he actually put it over top of what was in each frame well, mm-hmm. a scene. He's like... That is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. He just yeah. played it on a piano at yeah. first and said, What do you think about this? Don't, 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 don't. Dun, 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 dun. And, yeah, and he th- he didn't take it seriously. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's how the movie opens up. It's just a black that's screen, the and you hear that. Yeah, you're seeing the perspective of the, the shark, shark underwater. Oh, yeah. And that's the only time. Well, I shouldn't say the only times, time, yeah. but a couple times. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's kind of funny because it takes an a, an enormous distance for that shark too, because they're normally in South Africa. To migrate all the way up to the mm-hmm. the New York coast. Right, the shark has no business being out this yeah. far, pretty much. Even though there are sharks around the area, but they're a great white, mm-hmm. a big predator like this has no business. And then it claims its territory yet, which is <laughs> you, you can have it. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really common then, but is common now. The great white is moving into the Cape May area, the Cape Cod area. Yep, really okay. And mm-hmm. then obviously Shark Week's gonna tell you this, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can get all your facts on Shark Week when it comes out every August. We can thank this movie for Shark Week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Michael Phelps raced against a shark. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really racist. It's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. But then, yeah, and then um, the hunt. The hunt goes on for like the last, I would say, like forty minutes of the movie or so. Yeah. The pursuing Roughly. of it, the trying to figure out. Because their boat is so small, and then there's the iconic line, we're going to need a bigger boat, because... It is like two separate movies in one. It is. You've got like almost an, I guess, a drama going on when you're trying to figure out what is actually attacking these people, and then almost mm-hmm. a, a horror survival when they're on the boat trying to figure out mm-hmm. how to right. stop this monster. Exactly, because the shark is only getting more and more territorial. They only have some... I mean, they have a few guns, but that's not enough to really slow and stop this thing down. Then they come up with the idea of the barrels. Mm-hmm. I think it's brilliant. That's actually that's in the book, too. Yeah. With the barrels and how to try to slow him down, putting a tracker on him to locate him, see where he is. and um, But then the boat proves to be futile as it just the puts sh- its whole body on it and the just shark jumps sinks up it. And the shark jumps smashes the boat. Which apparently is true. Great whites can jump and... And crash boats like that. Mm-hmm. That's been known to do that. They said they can also ram into them too, because they their 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 noses, I believe, are called dorsals, 
Or is that just their fin? Fin, fin. dorsal okay. fins, yeah. But yeah, they can use their noses as rams and actually mm-hmm. go in and hit. I mean, they can smell blood from a mile away, even if it's just, just like a couple drops. Mm-hmm. I mean, these, these oh, things, they're incredible creatures. Incredible creatures, yeah. These things are they live around the time of dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. This this movie actually started my fascination with sharks. I think and, a lot of people. Too. Oh yeah, a lot easily, of easily. And when you think about it, it's actually kind of a dumb concept, really, because. How often do you hear, oh, a movie about a shark is actually going to be interesting? Right. But this movie, I mean, especially when you, if you <laughs> want to watch the sequels or other. You can if you want, after, but you don't have to. Yeah. You obviously don't have to, but. I think <laughs> three is probably the best sequel because it's probably the most ridiculous. <laughs> it's literally <laughs> SeaWorld and Jaws, all right? That actually could have been a. That actually is kind of an interesting premise. I will give it that, even though it wasn't handled. I think for, if it wasn't called Jaws 3... 3D? Yeah. <laughs> yeah 3D. It, it, it's an 80s 3D. <laughs> and, it, and you can tell. Uh, but um, they did have... Oh, gosh. The, the shark follows the, the Brody family. Uh, why? That is, From New York. But here's the real, original question I, I would have for the original movie. Why the fuck would the shark follow three guys on a boat... Compared to the food source at the shore. I said the same thing, too. Like, in the movie, they make it look like the shark has a personality. (laughs) Like, even at night, it knows it's at night. And they're like, oh, man, these guys are still out here? Oh, I'm going to crash into this boat, shake it around a little bit. Definitely Hollywood eyes. Especially, there's actually a really clever video that somebody made on YouTube where uh, he edited parts of the film together to make it seem like some members of the crew were actually trying to be sympathetic and save the shark. Yeah, they actually did a really good job trying to make it seem as though with the dialogue that they were actually trying to like help the shark and not kill it. That was kind of funny, but uh, and then of course you know what we were talking about before when the shark actually lands on the boat, um, it kills Quint, which kind of has a lot of symbolic meaning with his back character. Mm-hmm. And then you know Hooper's still down in the broken cage as he tries to thwart the shark in another way, but he he breaks the cage open and then Hooper goes in hiding. And then Chief Brody with that rifle and just like that weird angle that he's hauling onto the boat. Smile, you smile, smile you son of a boom! <laughs> oh, then the big explosion and then the very... And, and what makes Jaws a really interesting story is the hero, Chief Brody, played by Roy Scheider, mm-hmm. he's not really a hero character. He's not. He's, he's afraid not your... of water. Yeah. He's kind of uh, clumsy and nervous in a way. Right. Uh, he, These are your he, average he, people. He he means well. He's the chief of police, and he doesn't. You know, he is there to protect people. Mm-hmm. But they're like the mayor. There is forces that are against what he's trying to do and what he's attempting to do, and he feels helpless at some points. Yeah. And when it is, does come time for him to go into the boat and into the water, he's. He's a wreck. He's like, I really don't want to go, but mm-hmm. he he feels a certain obligation to. He does, and it's probably he's, he's got be- a job to do. And it's probably one because it's that, but also I I think the turning point was the third attack on the shore was on the Fourth of July. Yeah, and that was in front of everybody. There's no hiding it. Yeah, there's no denying it. Like literally, no. you saw this shark take that kid. And then no, it was the guy. The guy in the boat. It was oh. the guy in the boat, and Brody's son That's was right. in the boat that got tipped the over. Got ran. Yeah, because people, people were in panic mode. They didn't know what to think when that boy was gone, and then the raft is chewed up. And yeah, the, the woman knows it was a shark, and then she has that really devastating moment where she's in her funeral garb, slaps Chief Brody, saying, "You knew there was a shark out there, yet you didn't close the beaches and you did nothing." Which is funny because in some ways I would have like turned to the mayor and been like, you see, this is what you did. This is what you did. Yeah. yeah. So in reality, you're saying the mayor is the villain in this whole story, not the shark. The mayor yeah. is the villain. <laughs> yeah. You can see the mayor is a villain. Well, right? even in the book, he's kind of the villain because they said he's got mob ties and that's why oh, he has to yeah. keep the beach open because he owes them so much money and he was going to take the money out of the town's real estate and there was actually, or economic. In the second book, Jaws 2, that's like actually after the shark attack, after the shark has done its damage, the town of Amity is dead. In the second book, it should like that's not what the that's not what the, the second movie did. But in the second book, the mob takes over everything. Mm. Like this town is decimated from like the tragic uh, shark attacks that have happened, and then the mob actually takes over. 
in the second. But that would have been something I would have liked to have seen in the second movie, but oh, that's yeah. not what happened. You instead, know, you get a rehashing of the same movie from the first time, but instead it's a bunch of kids on a boat in a lighthouse. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. I think what would have made a better sequel would have been the three guys. Quint, Hooper, and Brody. I don't think... I mean, yeah, the the shark kind of steals the show, and that's the focal point. Yeah, it became a focal point. Yeah. But but I think, it, you know, this is one of the very rare cases, and there's quite a few people out there who do say that the movie's actually better than the book. And I agree. The mm-hmm. ending of the book is a downer. It, it it doesn't have the climatic ending. It's it's basically kind of the same thing. Yeah. Hooper dies in the cage, yes. and then the shark jumps up on the boat. Quint is harpooning the shark in the stomach to try to kill it, but the rope from the barrels wrap around his leg or his ankle. And as the shark gets off the boat, it just drags Quint into the water and he drowns. Okay. And then the ship sinks at like uh, an incredible fast rate Mm -hmm. that most ships don't normally sink at. Yeah. And then since Brody can't swim, he just holds on to a, a life preserver of sorts. Yeah. And he sees the shark coming at him, and then within a foot, the shark just dies from the wounds. Dies from his wounds, and, and, and the barrel's and, attached to him. Yeah, and, and it just down. sinks that's in the water. That's so boring. And yeah. that is the ending. That's the ending of the book. That's the ending of the book. Oh, of man. course. Thanks for writing yeah. the book for me, and now I'm not yeah. going to read it. Of course, <laughs> right. of course, Spielberg wanted to really like go with a bang, and he did. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it may not be logically plausible. He His excuse was, I have them wrapped in my fingers for... Two and a half hours. They'll believe anything I throw at them. Yeah. And here's a funny story too. I believe that was the last shot of the movie, which is very rare. But they said that because they got so behind in production that they mm-hmm. filmed everything on land okay. first and got all that stuff out of the way. Makes sense. Because the ocean, because they really shot in the Atlantic Ocean. And That's awesome. <laughs> and yeah, it's challenging as hell as the movie proved. Because you got salt water that's messing with the mechanics of the shark. They rushed production because the book was a hot seller and they wanted the movie out so that people would be like, oh wow, they turned the book into a movie. Okay. So they didn't have time to test the shark. They didn't have time to properly. Get, that's why they had so many issues with it. Oh, yeah, with the salt water causing an issue with the shark, mm-hmm. too. Salt water causes problems with anything. Anything. Absolutely. I mean, like in other movies, they would film just in a tank. Mm-hmm. They would film in a tank with some water, fresh and, water, to and, make things easy. And they wanted the actual ripples and the true look of the ocean. Sometimes they'd have sailboats go by. They, it wasn't like a close set mm-hmm. <laughs> of sorts. I just a testament to Spielberg's like tough direction that he really was going for realism yeah. and authenticity. But they said that uh, he actually let his camera assistants, I believe, film um, Brody shoot the shark. He okay. wasn't there. He was on a plane. <laughs> yeah, he was on a plane. He was on a plane with Richard Dreyfuss, and he turned to Spielberg and said. So as the movie coming around, and he's like, oh, I set up, and the guys are shooting the movie. And he goes, wait, before you, like, you're not shooting the last shot? Yeah. <laughs> and Spielberg was like, ah, no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> and this, they, was a, this, this was a long process. I'm, I'm moving on. And supposedly, Spielberg does not shoot the last uh, shot or scene of his movies at all anymore. I didn't and That's that. his because thing. Because of how well Jaws did, he took it as a sign that a that's how... A sign of how, luck almost, yeah. kind of. Okay, interesting. So there's a shot somewhere in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, whether it's the actual schedule of the last day or if it's actually the last shot of the movie. I, I don't know. He doesn't know, film it. Okay. But he doesn't film it. He doesn't film it. That's <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, um, when we were talking about the because of the production failures, limiting the shark on film actually ended up becoming a strength of the movie where you don't see the shark as often because we get more focus on the characters and a lot that we get is when the three are on the boat mm-hmm. and one of my favorite scenes is when we get quint talking about his background he has that great the epic model the, the uss indianapolis which was a real battleship that was sunk by an imperial japanese submarine and there was about 1200 people on board 300 of them or so sank with the ship and about 900 were left to fend for themselves and a lot of them died from Heat exhaustion, dehydration, uh, saltwater poisoning, and shark attacks. And I think only three, only a handful survived. 
And Quint was one of them. I think 300 out of... So I think it was like 300 some survived. And it was the biggest naval loss in history. I also had heard a story that some people weren't aware of what actually happened in the USS Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a wife and mother who didn't know what happened to her husband. Oh, wow. And she saw Jaws and actually thanked the actors or Steven Spielberg or just reached out to whoever helped on the movie and said, thank you for, for that because now I understand what happened to my husband. Because he was really on cool. the That's Indianapolis. Really nice. yeah. Wow, yeah. That's really nice. You know, they never, yeah, like the... Tragic, but nice. The government never disclosed that with her. And wow. Yeah, and it took Jaws to do that. Interesting fact, um, after Jaws was finished, they were actually thinking about doing a sort of a prequel to do a film about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis oh. and what happened to the men. And maybe we would have seen like a younger Quint in oh. the movie. And of course, like when you get these ideas, you think that's a really, really good idea. But then like, even nowadays and back then studios had no idea what people wanted. They're like, Hey, remember this great idea about the prequel to the USS Indianapolis, a story that people don't really know about, which could make a great movie. We'll throw that shit out. Let's just make Jaws 2. <laughs> we'll throw that shit in the trash. Let's just make a, a generic sequel with featuring more of the shark. And then we'll, people will just eat it up. And then we'll, people will continue to fund us so we can make more Jaws movies and not make more interesting ideas. I, I actually would have liked, I heard about that yesterday when I did some research on this movie and I was like I would have liked to have seen that I would have liked to have seen that you said people eat it up but I'm tired people eat it up <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and also not just the production flair of the shark there were um, some um, there was some tension being uh, boiled inside the real actors of Richard Dreyfus and Robert Shaw they yep. didn't like each other I think that was was it Spielberg who kind of told Robert Shaw to get on his nerves or maybe uh, it was just Robert Shaw really getting into the acting, his performance. I had, I had heard Robert Shaw is very competitive in everything and anything. Okay. And Richard Dreyfus was 26 or 27. He had done, I believe American Graffiti came out already. Yeah. And Did Close Encounters of the Third Kind come after Jaws or I before Jaws? I think that Jaws? Came, after Jaws. came after Jaws. But he was in a movie that he, he originally didn't want to be in Jaws. Okay. Richard Dreyfus. And he said that, because he knew it was going to be, as he, and I quote, a bitch to shoot. Which, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> he wasn't wrong, no. <laughs> and, and he was in a movie called The Apprenticeship of Diddy or Deddy Kravitz, whatever the, I don't, I don't even know, it seems like a forgettable movie anyway. But he said he thought he was absolutely awful that he called Steven Spielberg back and begged him to be in Jaws. Okay. And I guess when he, they were filming Jaws, that movie came out, and with all the problems and stuff going on, he would actually say things like, I shouldn't even be here. I should be promoting my movie, having tea, and being at Hollywood parties and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And Robert Shaw was a guy who went through the ringer, and who's also a big intimidating guy. Yeah. He really got his nerves. He, he like, was like, "Who are you, kid?" Yeah, and, you know, and that's what kind of triggered it. And I was in the sting, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I was a Bond villain, you ass. <laughs> Wait, he was a Bond villain. We're Russia with love. Holy shit! Yeah, he was the main. He was the main man. villain against Sean Connery in that movie. Damn, oh, yeah. that is badass. He was. He was Russia's answer to James Bond, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well then, yes. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, dude. It has. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but they said that he was he was a pro about it. There were times they said that Shaw had a drinking problem too, and him really getting the character, yeah, right? like him he, really he would, delving into it. I think he asked if he could actually get drunk for the scar scene and the USS Indianapolis mm-hmm. speech, and yeah. Steven it's Spielberg great, gave him the. Oh, gave him the go-ahead and he actually had to get walked on set because he got so bad but then he he apologized i think i know he at least asked like did i really humiliate myself bad yeah and they said yeah you look awful you know so let's looked get... awful or you did an awful job no it looked awful because i think awful. there was because okay. i believe in the interview somebody had said you really can't tell which one was him sober and which one was him drunk mm-hmm. from the dailies or the yeah, I mean, he really, whatever. Like that whole speech about like 
witnessing his crew getting eaten by sharks. Is, is, and the speech was actually written by um, John Milius, who mm-hmm. uh, was a fantastic screenwriter who wrote uh, based off of survival stories for that one scene. He had already written Apocalypse Now. He would go on to uh, write The Hunt for Red October. And he directed Cohen the Barbarian. Oh, shit. He directed oh, oh, oh. Conan the Barbarian and Red Dawn, which I still like to this day. I still like that movie, even though it, it's a fun kind of idea of a World War III movie, what could happen. Sure. But he's mostly known as a screenwriter. And that's I didn't know that he actually wrote that specific scene for, um, for Jaws. And he based it all on survival stories, and it's just... So much rich detail, and yeah, it really they, gets you in the, the mindset of what Quint is really going through right now. The, yeah, they said that uh, his version was, like, really long, too, and then Robert Shaw had read it and said, let me take some stuff out, put some, you know, like, pop to it, and then mm-hmm. I'll make it short, sweet, to the point, and put some drama and flair. Because okay. they said because they were all living in Martha's Vineyard for so long that the actors and Spielberg would go to Spielberg's house and they were constantly rewriting the script or reworking everything and they oh, said wow. it was actually such a really neat atmosphere because as they were rewriting stuff the actors were there and they'd say well how about what if my character would say this or act like this and then that would make the writing go a little smoother and it's like okay yeah you, you know what you would or yeah I'd bounce back off of that mm-hmm. and that's a really creative environment I'm sure that also helped them stay a little sane to go, okay, this movie will work. Because yeah. you, you know for a fact that you know, Universal's going, why are we over budget? Why is this taking so long? It seems like n- nobody... It's like a manager who's telling you to work harder and work better at a job where you're in manufacturing or something and your equipment's constantly breaking down and you're like, look, what do you want me to do? You know, yeah. My equipment's not getting fixed and this is all I... You know, I'm supposed yeah. to be like... You know, like building a, a machine here and all you give me is a hammer and a screwdriver <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, and it's like i don't care just just do what fix you gotta do it. yeah just, just, just make fix it happen it. Yeah. it's like what <laughs> oh, yeah. but this movie uh even though it's got a lot of terrifying suspenseful scenes it's not without it's like more heartfelt scenes too especially with chief brody and his son there's that one that one scene where he's just trying to get his son to laugh and he puts his hands over his eyes and then like does like a little peekaboo kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like that's just like a great uh, And that's right after he had the slap. Yes. Yeah. And he, just, he feels the guilt of the kid dying. Yeah, you know? that's Steven Spielberg's directing like really coming to fruition. Like it's mm-hmm. like every every movie out there, every great movie has a mixture of a lot of things. Like even Schindler's List, a dark tragic movie has like one or two subtle bits of comedy not about the holocaust but just about like certain moments of dialogue (laughs) with like the soldiers and then you know them being being complete asses and then like uh, oscar schindler calling him out and it's it's kind of a funny scene too only like not very much though but every movie has a little bit of everything and this movie Mm -hmm. has a little bit of comedy a little bit of drama a lot of suspense and horror and Heartfelt, touching moments. I remember Spielberg saying that it really wasn't supposed to be a horror movie. People classify it as a horror movie, but he said it's really a sea adventure. It is a suspenseful sea adventure thrill ride. It's a summer mm-hmm. thrill ride, like we were talking from the very beginning. Oh yeah, it is. And they said that when this movie came out, people just kept on going to see it again and again and again. And it really mm-hmm. is one of those go-to movies. Like, if you want something on... yeah. I feel like you can just... This is one of those movies that you can just put on. You can just and, put and, on. And, and it, it just part. works. Oh, yeah. Like, and you can all... put it on during Christmas and people will still be like, yeah, man, Jaws is good. Don't watch Jaws of <laughs> Revenge during Christmas because that place, that movie took place during Christmas. <laughs> oh, it oh, did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it did. <laughs> and, it, and it was a terrible idea, but that's what happened. But, yeah, like we said, like you can watch this movie at any point and it still holds up to this day. Yeah, even, it, even with, like... You can tell what's the mechanical shark and what's the real shark that was put in. If mm-hmm. eagle eye viewers can check that out, like, oh, that's real, that's a machine. But even then, the movie still holds up very because it doesn't use any special effects. There are no special effects. It's it's really all authentic, which is why it still holds up and it's still terrifying to a lot of people to this day. Oh, for sure. And all you need is that music too. Mm-hmm. You all know? you need is the music to get people just get suckered in. And that shark, even though. 
it's fake and you can tell definitely tell it's fake nowadays it was still terrifying as hell to, to see like especially oh, with yeah. the first time when you see it it's it's still underwater and it's coming up to that guy that he tipped over in the boat uh-huh and you, you just see like the white underbelly and the mouth and it just grabs him and drags him down yeah and then you just see that quick pop up and the mouth is just like grabbing the guy as he's screaming, he's and, still it, screaming and the blood it. squirting and it takes him down. Oh yeah, it's and then I found this really scary stuff. Um, when the boy, the second victim, Alex Kintner dies, yeah, there was actually supposed to be more of the shark scene. Okay. And then this is what the picture is here. Almost kind of looks like a little bit of a Photoshop, but that's what actually. Wow. We, we have an image popped up right here. And for anybody who wants to see this, just Google Alex Kintner death from Jaws. And you will see the image of, uh, I think this was a dummy shot. And the shark coming out of the water with its mouth open, ready to chomp down on the boy. And it's a terrifying image. Yeah. I mean, it, it is way more frightening than, uh, oh, oh gosh. Yeah. It, Especially it's done in like the black and gray. Mm -hmm. Old timey. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's really, really something. I mean, you looking at this, you think that's a real shark. It, it's a, oh, the details it, that were given yeah. to the shark? Oh yeah, absolutely. It almost kind of reminds me of like that one image of the surfer going through the wave and you can see like the shark's shadow in the wave kind of. It kind of it, it, two different photos though, but it kind of gives me the same chill and suspense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very terrifying image. And it, 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 the movie was great at building suspense. But they also give you, like, some lighthearted moments. And the, the other thing, too, is for anybody who goes fishing, you, you have your good days, you have your bad days, you catch something, you don't. These guys are making a point to try to catch this yeah. shark. You got the guys with their wife's roast beef and yeah. then they put on the meat hook and they just send it out of the water. But that's but, when you realize the size of that shark. When it tears that dock in half and then starts pulling it. Yeah. And the strength that it's like you're going up a, a beast of nature. <laughs> and that's what he is. He's a force of nature. Oh, for sure. And yeah, this, this, is, this is what the shark is. Absolutely. I gotta say, when they, when they catch the tiger shark... I don't know who this guy is, but he gives me a crack every time when uh, who, they're asking, like, what kind of shark is this? The one we just caught. Tiger shark. A what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wanted that guy to be in every single Spielberg movie in the 80s. <laughs> like, when Indiana Jones is talking about, this is the Ark of the Covenant. The, the what? what? <laughs> I wanted him to be that guy. Like, it's a velociraptor. A what? <laughs> you want me to do what? <laughs> I wish he was in like all other Spielberg movies. <laughs> same outfit though, with the hat. Same outfit with a hat, and, and the same the same reaction, the same line delivery. If he had done that, I would have lost my shit. Could you imagine him in Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom? Kalima, Kalima. The what? The what? what? <laughs> As he rips the dude's heart out. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> yeah, then he runs the fuck out. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I think those were actually real people that lived in that Martha's Vineyard. I think it had to have been, yeah. I think they said they did use a lot of people. A lot of local extras. extras. Yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, Once you well, delivered these lines, yeah. like this. That's good. That's really good. Oh my god. <laughs> A what? A what? <laughs> <laughs> I get um that I, a lot of not just not just the the great white but also even like the dead tiger shark that has a lot of good detail to that shark mm -hmm. as well. Oh yeah, I thought it was real. I thought it was real too. Well, I'm like I'm sure animal rights activists would have come down hard on them if that was a real shark because well, sharks are kind of they're not in the endangered species list, but there's a lot of red tape right now yeah. with with them. Oh, right now, I mean, what was it like in? But that was in the seventies. I mean, yeah. yeah. But now the sharks are there's not there's not as many of them as there used to be. These things are freaking dinosaurs. They were in the same time as the dinosaurs. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they're still wondering if megalodon still exists. We don't know because they're deep oh, sea. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't. <laughs> We're we already are. talking about this. Shitty Jaws the Revenge. We don't need to bring up the Meg. Too late, you, the Meg. <laughs> you just did, so we opened the door. 
Oh, and then when that scene where like they just have the shark and they just like you could just Hooper just like gutting that shark and just like foul smelling and just like ripping out like oh, yeah, the, the, the license plate. Like he didn't they, need a car, did he? <laughs> no, they're because sharks are some sharks are bottom feeders. They'll just eat anything. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. They, that was the other thing about the movie. For as suspenseful and scary as it could be, it had a lot of really good, funny one-line quips to mm-hmm. it too. And that's what kind of I don't want to say kills the mood, but lightens it up a bit. Where you're kind of like, oh, well, I guess it's not so bad now. You know, they're on land, they're cracking jokes, but it really is a a whole new territory once the three guys get in the boat. Oh yeah, because yeah, you're in the sharks domain and they make it look like they're out so far Mm -hmm. in the ocean where there's no help they're isolated it's just them the ocean and the shark and you don't know where the shark is you know where it's gonna pop up it's like at the end when that boat sinks it's like brody sees the shark in front of him as he's shooting at it yeah but what if the shark would just to like go underwater and he's like what the heck, and then boom, just pops up underneath it. Hey, mm-hmm. game over. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's the end, man. Uh, Do they ever mention how far away from land they are? No, uh, they don't. They never. They I never remember really Spielberg saying he wanted to make sure that when he shot the movie, that he wanted to make sure you didn't see land. Because mm-hmm. if people did see land, That's they would more they would have been like, "Well, why don't you just go back to the shore?" You and know, get, it's like, getting a little too or, intense. Yeah, get supplies and things like that. When in the book, they actually went back to shore every night. Oh, they did. Yeah, they did. I didn't know that. Okay. You know, in the movie, it was just they spent one night out there. They I, talked about going back. You know, just hearing all this book talk, I think the movie definitely is better than the book. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, it's got to be because oh, jeez. <laughs> Well, if you look at the horizon at the end of the movie too, when um, wow, Quint, Quint, not even Quint. I might say names. I'm trying to say Richard Dreyfuss and Roy, uh, yeah. but Hooper, yeah, yeah. Or Hooper, yeah. And if you look, you can actually see the land on the horizon, but it's way out there. So that's okay. That's also because they have it hooked up to the boat. They have the shark hooked up to the boat, and they're trying to drag it back to drown him in the shallow water. No, no, no. At the whole end, where they're on the two barrels. Oh, the yeah, yeah, the two yeah, barrel. Yeah, the okay. seagulls are like feasting on yeah. the remains of the shark. Yeah. And then there's that final shot, and just like it's almost like with them just walking on shore, it's like you don't care how far, how long it took, they just got there. Mm -hmm. You know what? They're there. And the music. Don't need to explain it. And then the music's playing, and it's just this sea going, like it sounds like beach music. Mm -hmm. It's just the calm, relaxing, and it's like it's that weight off of our backs. Like okay, it's it's dead. We can now move on. Did we? Did we? <laughs> Until part of me would, another one came. <laughs> part of me would question, like, wouldn't there be at some point in part of your mind, like, is there another one? Like, yeah, like, you know, especially when they're like paddling in the water. I, my brain was going, wait, what if there was another one? Uh-huh. It doesn't that, mean that there's right. one that size. That's true. But as we've, <laughs> as we've said, there are other species of sharks out there that are just as dangerous. I mean, hell, they did find a tiger shark. They found tiger summer. sharks are pretty, they're pretty big, too. They're, they're not small sharks. I mean, it's not a lemon shark we're talking about. I mean, Jesus. A stingray. A stingray. Well, I guess we should. Steve Irwin died from a stingray. <laughs> you, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> hey, it just goes to show that the ocean is a deadly, scary place, and people swim There are in. parts of the ocean that haven't even been explored yet, or, or they don't want to explore. I, I, yeah. I'm sure I, that's I true. Mean, we've what, explored, what, maybe 10%, and the planet's covered in 70% water? 70% water, 30% land. Yeah. So... Tell that to kids and they don't believe you. It's yeah. like, well, look at the globe. And hey, it's not flat. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes me wonder where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> we can save that for another yeah, day. Yeah, we, we, can, like, we can. Like, why is that theory? <laughs> no, the, the earth is flat. It's like, huh? Oh, that's God. a whole other, that's a geography lesson. <laughs> they also need to learn their lesson in physics, too, because, I mean, shit would just fall you know mm-hmm. and just crash <laughs> yeah 
Oh, I gotta say, like with the ending though, because uh, I did watch this episode of MythBusters where they actually they proved pretty much like ninety percent of the movie is all bullshit. Yeah. It's all bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it's the Hollywood treatment, but people don't people don't care because like it's it's epic and it's suspenseful as all hell. But like they actually tried to set up a dummy shark like in a pond, it's bigger than a pond, but like they tried using the same rifle like did it how did how did the air tank the gas tank explode in the shark's mouth killing it did they have to hit it from a side did they have to hit it dead on and even if you hit the if you hit in the good spot it's just gonna like push the uh, the gas tank even further down the shark's mouth and it would probably still be alive it just, or it, it wouldn't do anything it, the bullet would just re- ricochet it, off the, the tank would just react like if you blew up a balloon and you didn't tie it and you just let it go yeah that's it would just but, go. Everywhere. But then just for a laugh, they just they brought him like a high powered rifle and they shot it and it exploded. <laughs> like if you had a high powered rifle that was like a Dragunov sniper rifle, it would have blown up into pieces. But that's not what he had. He had like a thirty odd six or something. Yeah. And if there was C four on the tank, <laughs> right, a C four dynamite. You know, oh god! I would rather watch that ending where it, it was like a balloon letting it go and just watching the shark get out of the water and flapping in the wind on the way up. <laughs> 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 Could you just see like? Oh my god! Another. another... Could you see Brody's face? Like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> like all its teeth are getting knocked out and they're flying. That's all it took. Yeah. I could just see Brody like with like the people's eyebrow, like, huh? <laughs> Is the shark having a seizure? Right, right, right. <laughs> There was another inconsistency, like when the shark like breaks through the glass and it, it's like trying to get Brody inside the boat, and then. People, some forgiving fans have been saying, well, it's just kind of, it's kind of uh, letting itself go and going backwards, but sharks can't swim backwards. That was like one thing, like the shark yeah, breaks yeah. through the window, they're incapable of swimming backwards. They have to swim in like one direction. They, they actually are incapable of going backwards. So, and the people were like, oh, well, he's kind of sliding off the boat and then he's just kind of refiguring its, its bearings, but it would have to do like a 180 inside the boat in order for it to get out of there. Mm-hmm. It couldn't just go backwards. So that was like one thing that, you know, some um, marine biologists were pointing out like, oh, a shark wouldn't have been able to do that. It would have had to do a 180 inside the boat. It couldn't just swim backwards. It can't do that. That's not how a shark works. There, there are a lot but, of But, you know, there's, there's the things you can nitpick, but and this is me being nitpicky. Yeah, this I is, mean... This is me being nitpicky. I mean, well, that's what we talk about on here. There, it, yeah. it, It's a very entertaining movie, and especially nowadays in 2019 and even a few years prior... A lot of people have become nitpicky at, about movies, and it's both a blessing and a curse because we're, mm-hmm. we're used to classics like this, and we go, "Look, it's Hollywood. We know right. a lot of this stuff, oh, yeah. it, you know." Yeah. But now, I think because like it, it's almost like the people who do read the books and say, "Oh, the book was so much better. Why didn't they just do this in the movie?" Or... After hearing all this book talk, I'm still convinced the movie's better. Well, this, this book, yeah. I mean, this book and movie, <laughs> better than this book for sure. I mean, but then you get something like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and you yeah. might say, like, you know, general consensus and the, the classic Gene Wilder one is yeah. much better than Tim Burton's, mm-hmm. and the book, you know, is its own thing. But people always are going to have correlations like that. And then there's also so much more you can put into a book than compared to what you can a movie. Like, you know, the book you're creating, the story in your mind, you can pace yourself to the words. And the movie is, you know, how long can you keep the the audience riveted and captivated and their attention for a two hour period? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, before they say like, "Oh, is this a part where I could go to the bathroom or not even care?" You because know, that's their job is to keep you in that chair. Yeah. Funny thing is, I can't even like, I if I have to go to the bathroom, I will pause this movie just because like I don't want to move. I I know the shit's coming, but yeah, <laughs> I will still pause the movie because I'm like, I want to watch it. I don't mm-hmm. want to like be like, all right, I know this, but. It's very one of the few movies that I do that with because I actually like keeping the tension there. Mm-hmm. Be like, if I miss something while I'm in the bathroom, I'm like, well, this fucked the whole rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, and there are nitpicky parts to this movie, oh, I, and I think also that has to do with um, the schedule, the conflicts that they had with it the trouble as production. well. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. like like the dock, like when they when the shark pulls the dock off with the guys in the meat. And then the, you see the dock circle around, mm-hmm. but then the shark's not there. So, well, what the hell turned the dock around 
Mm-hmm. Jesse and had Hook it. We're still in his mouth. Yeah, I, I, mean, to, yeah, I, guess. Guess. Yeah. I got I'm, nothing. I'm trying I, yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying to justify it. <laughs> exactly. Like there, there's not a whole lot to like really hate about this movie because it's so damn good. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can watch it and still be entertained throughout oh, all of it. Yeah, there's absolutely. no no problems at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, there. I was even thinking there really isn't a bad scene in the movie. I don't think it, so. You know, just like The Exorcist, there really isn't anything that is there to go. Like, oh, come on. No, no, or, mm-hmm. or, like, I can skip this. Or and... just like, no, no. Yeah. There's no way that would happen. Or that's that's ridiculous. You know, mm-hmm. like, what, a 30-foot shark to, what, pushing, like, 3,000 pounds, if not more? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, you're going to be like, well, I, I don't know. I've never been a shark that big. <laughs> yeah. So I've... it's like, it could but, be but plausible. Look, but look at how many things that we do find later on in a Guinness Book of World Records. Like, just because it's not totally out there Mm -hmm. you know and in breaking news or anything like that or something that we got to learn in school doesn't mean that it's not out there right and yeah (laughs) (laughs) it definitely this definitely does open your eyes too to how it it, it, just think about this too we also said great whites are usually from south africa Mm -hmm. and we hear all the time that there are shark infested waters and then there are waters where they're not. And then there are those people who say, Oh, I swim in this ocean all the time and the sharks don't come in there. But then there's that one day oh, yeah. where a shark yeah. still comes in there. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, that's a warning. I always looked at things like this. The ocean is the home for all these sea creatures and they're, you know, that's their domain. That's how they survive. I mean, like fish need the ocean to survive. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And how would you feel if like random people came into your house? How would you react? Oh, That's yeah. pretty much what we as people are doing with them in the yeah. ocean. Mm-hmm. And we know the science behind a shark. They swim, they eat, they procreate. Yeah. Yeah. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. They don't they don't just randomly attack. That's the other thing. You know, they said that most of the time you could probably swim by a shark. And it will leave you alone. Yeah. If, I don't recommend you actually do that. <laughs> don't put that to the test. Yeah, but. no. I mean, I'm not going to go into the Baltimore Aquarium and say, oh, I'm just going to go swim in the shark exhibit. Because, With a white tip shark and yeah, a tiger yeah. shark. You know, I'll be fine. Yeah, you know. I, mean, I go, A, you're probably getting arrested. And B, you're probably <laughs> getting arrested. <laughs> you're going to get a probably good chunk bitten out of you. Especially exactly. if it's feeding time. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Uh, not going to. Oh, that scene where they dump all the chum and all like the bloody fish heads in the water. Yeah. And he's not even realizing just chucking that shit out. And also, <laughs> I know. That's when you really get like the first. It's at that point. It's like, like the movie is already like halfway through. And then we finally get to see the up close image of what the shark looks and like head what on. What a scene that was. That was so good. Mm-hmm. Like the, the chum and the blood and Roy oh, Scheider. And that just that wah. Yeah. And then Roy Scheider just nailed that. Jumps up. Holy shit. <laughs> it makes me wonder if that actually wasn't supposed to happen like that. Like the shark malfunctions just enough to shoot out. I don't know. Because it seemed like know. more genuine than a, just an act. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a cutaway shot, though, too. It's, yeah. So, I mean, unless that was. I, I didn't hear any stories about. If that was like an accident or if anybody tried to scare him for real. Mm-hmm. They did say that the you're going to need a bigger boat line was him yeah, ad lib. Yeah. That was an ad lib. That was a nice ad lib too. That's a very yeah. good ad lib. It's Some one of the most iconic not... lines in, the, in Heck, cinema yeah. history. But, man, both like the most iconic lines from the movie are from Roy Scheider too. Seriously. Yeah. How is it that the 70s, they must have done something to just get everything right. The 70s was just like... The time period of all these... I mean, you could argue that time is the reason why these movies are so well, great. I think it's but. also because they knew movies were a business, but the people that... The directors and creators who actually were behind it cared about the art. Mm-hmm. Well, that, now, like now you were saying earlier about the practical effects. like They tried to do it as real as possible yeah. mm-hmm. so that it it's made it that feel realism, real. That realism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's one reason why it holds up. But it, it's kind of like the same thing with the music business today. You know, it, it's... And what is it that Eddie Izzard says? It's 80% how you look and... Yeah, like 20, ten, yeah, 10% how, how you, you sound, sound. And, ten, and another 10 to like how you present yourself. And, and that's why you get all these 
musicians and certain actors that you know oh you're pretty okay yeah you know they'll take that <laughs> over somebody who will actually act and right you know and and now you, you get so many people who do independent movies too and think that it'll just reach a box office and they'll make it dirt cheap and yeah mm-hmm. that's when that's when it becomes more about the art and not so yeah. much about the budget and the profit yeah and that and that was the other thing too and they people really poured heart and souls out especially beginners i mean spielberg was a beginner here he was you know, superman richard donner was a beginner oh wow um i mean he only made i think he just made the omen he had made the omen before superman. i think he might have made a couple other things but not like he's big still, major yeah, hits still right. in his career he's in his like, career he made the first two lethal weapon movies uh, actually made all the lethal weapon say, movies I think he made all of them. goonies yeah. the goonies, goonies yeah wasn't that a spielberg uh, production team. Yes, it was a yeah. production. It was, yeah. And the, after this movie, actually, because um, we were talking about Superman and other podcasts another day, we were, um, Spielberg was actually considered to direct Superman the movie, um, but they wanted to see how the box office did for Jaws first. And because it was such oh. a huge success, he got so many other offers for other places that he moved on. Mm. But they were actually really interested to see what he can do. He almost directed a Superman movie, but all the offers poured in after how well this movie did, and he went on to something else. That's funny because nowadays he's like so uptight about comic book movies too. Oh yeah. I mean, he yeah. he said things like, "Oh, they're gonna be like westerns and fade out." Yeah, because he didn't direct one. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was exactly. talking. The one they were talking about was Blackhawks. That was that was a comic book property. It's a very hmm. obscure comic book property, but it basically revolves around a couple ace pilots during World War Two. And that's technically a comic book. That oh, was something that was talked about last year. I don't know if it's gonna, actually going to go through, but that was talked about. And Warner Brothers approached him for that. I think another thing about comic book movies that have these guys held at a certain uh, issue, standard of sorts, is um, yeah. they, they don't get that freedom to do the movies that they want to do anymore because the comic book, frenzy if you will is such a big thing right now that they know studios know that they'll make money and that's what they want to do so a spielberg could go up and say hey i want to do like whatever and it'll be great and they're like yeah but you know we'd we'd really like to yeah like do a rorschach spin off a watchman or something yeah. you know and he and he's like ah, i don't know yeah. if i want to do that even Ridley Scott, I think, was another one who's got issues with comic book movies. And he, uh, I think he did too. But he did, well, uh, fucking Alien and, uh, oh, fuck is that? Blade Runner? Runner? Yeah, Blade Runner. But they became comic book properties. I think, like, Dark Horse wasn't, Alien wasn't always a Dark Horse property. I think it eventually, Dark Horse, I think, just maybe got the comic book right, got rights to do Alien for a comic book series. I think that's how it happened. I'm not sure. Because I, I think Alien's the whole original idea. Yeah. I don't I, think that was ever a comic book property. No, the books were better than the movie on that one, though. Oh, really? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're actually very similar. So it's like they're both... It's just the ending's the difference. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that, but that's another example, though, of... <laughs> Yeah, like it's, the, it, it's okay to do that, and it, it, and this is based off of a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. but a comic book is like oh because that's the crazy we can't do it. it look how many no books were actually yeah. yeah. Look how many books are actually based or movies are based off of books. We were talking about Watchmen not long ago. That graphic novel is still being talked about in college universities about yeah. a depiction of what World War Three could be like with this well, idea of like grounded superheroes well, throughout time. Um. Yeah. There's also a story about a producer, his name's Michael Uslan. He was known for getting the first Batman movie right. going. Mm-hmm. He actually got credited while being a student at his college university for teaching a comic book class. Mm-hmm. And at first his dean said, I'm going to turn this down. You know, comic books are fun, cheap, junk entertainment. Right. And he said, well, what if I convince you that they're, they're more and they're not? And he said, all right. Give it a try. And he said, are you familiar with the story of Moses? And he said, yes, I am. Well, can you describe it? Said, well, chosen son, uh, the survived, was put in a wicker basket, sent down the River Nile, and becomes a figure and leads the people out and saves the day pretty much. And he goes, okay, well, are you familiar with the origin of Superman? 
There you go. And, and, <laughs> and you he go. said, so you see the influence to yeah. it, and he actually credited his, his course. That's, that's, so, actually, that's, that's a good story. Yeah. You know, so in a lot of ways, you know, comic book stories and characters could essentially just be the same thing. I mean, like, oh, yeah. just talking about Alien. Mm-hmm. How is that really all that much different than Jaws? It's not. It even, is... even didn't they say back then Alien was basically Jaws in space? It, yeah. They did. Because they, really Scott took the Jaws approach by not showing the xenomorph so often. Mm-hmm. And that's what made it all the more terrifying. Oh yeah. It was just like Jaws. It was unprecedented. Yeah. We had never seen anything like this before. Uh, should we go into our uh, favorite scenes? Yeah, favorite, I, favorite, favorite scene. I'm like. trying to think if there's anything else that we can talk about. I Because there's always so... I mean, Jaws is just a classic, but... I mean, people have talked about this movie for years, and all the themes it has, all the thing it has, things it had going for it, the risks and the success. Starting the summer blockbuster, like yeah. making sure big hit movies should come out. It was the biggest movie until Star Wars dethroned it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it was also big in merchandise. It was like I don't know if it was one of the first movies that had big merchandise sales, but they made a big deal about it. Mm-hmm. And it it started. It was a pop culture reference yeah. too. It wasn't just like I remember watching that '70s show, and you guys know we used to watch that show religiously. Yeah, and they covered like all sorts of major grounds in that show that was pop culture references from bands to movies. And one thing that they didn't mention was Jaws. Really, yeah. in that show, right. yeah. yeah. The, I don't. I don't recall them mentioning Jaws. Hell, in Detroit Rock City, at the beginning of that movie, they show the poster. They show of Jaws. the Jaws poster. Yeah, because yeah. it's like it, it takes place in the seventies. It was a big in... pop culture thing. Oh yeah. They and they did say that people became more aware of sharks and more aware of the water and the ocean. Then, mm-hmm. and hell, they Universal Studios had that awesome ride. Oh yeah, dude. that was oh, yeah. amazing. I was terrified. I was terrified of that too. ride. I remember being on that ride when I was five. <laughs> but but it was so great because it was like if you like one it was like a movie set that was a playground for you know adults and kids. All the big properties. I I have not been there in so long, but it, I remember it. It played. It, they even played the music. You had mm-hmm. a boat that was attacked and sank, and you saw the shark. Go, it, it, oh my god! You had the explosions, and then you had the the shark's dead body uh-huh. like, and, and, you even coming got, to the surface. The burn marks on it. You even oh. got the one last jump before mm-hmm. it sinks into the water and dies. It was it was a well made ride, and it was it was actually one of Universal Studios' longest. Oldest of attractions there. Okay. And then Did they I, just get rid of it recently too? Uh, 2012, I think they oh, got rid of it. Uh, uh, it's it, tragic. It's, but there is one in Japan. Oh. There's yeah. a Universal Studios in, in Japan. Japan and they have it there. It's road trip to Japan. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> just for one ride. Yeah, exactly. Well, I said road trip, I mean drive in the water and then go to Japan. Yeah. Well, Submarine it. Well, I'd go for a katana sword too. Oh I mean, a handcraft. <laughs> get a handcrafted katana sword. Oh yeah. God. Oh, yeah. Kill Bill, anybody? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Samurai Cop. Oh, oh no. Samurai Cop. <laughs> what does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. <laughs> You had That's to go was, there, I Jeff. Had to, I had to. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. Oh, you're my God. welcome. <laughs> oh, my God. Anybody, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Samurai Cop, check it out sometime on a rainy day. <laughs> Don't we, take it seriously. <laughs> we are going to be talking about Samurai Cop to you audience members at some point. Probably soon, because... We have to. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's on Blu-ray. <laughs> I can't believe that movie is on Blu-ray. I can't believe it has a sequel. All right, it does have a sequel. Yeah, <laughs> wrap your head around that one, folks. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> anyway, should we go into scenes? Yep. Oh man, there's um, like I said before, like some of the best scenes are with the characters and not necessarily the shark. You know, the shark scenes are awesome, but the scene that I like the most is. When you had that conversation of Quint's monologue about his crew being eaten by sharks, just after that, when you start seeing the boat getting damaged a little bit, every, you know, uh, Chief Brody and Hooper, they're singing their drinking songs, but Quint is the only one that notices what's really going on right now is that the boat is actually under attack. And then he remains calm throughout this entire little scene. Start the engine, get things ready. Like he takes command and 
so much wrong goes happens within this one little scene. Like there's a fire on the boat, and just by telling Quinn's character, he just looks at Hooper and just or Quinn just goes, not Quinn, uh, Chief Brody just says, put out the fire. He could be screaming this line, yeah, he's put totally out the fire, calm. but he's totally calm. That's in his character, and that's just who he is. It's such a tiny little moment, but you know, just. They're falling, they're tripping over their own selves, they're trying to like sober up in this moment where they're under attack by the shark. There's a fire on the boat, they're trying to extinguish it, and they're trying to put the barrels and trying to shoot the shark. All so much wrong happens in just this tiny little moment. Chaos just spills in this boat, and then it's just such a tiny little moment, but that's like honestly my favorite scene in the whole movie. Just nice. after that monologue, so much so much happens, and it's so cool. I love it. I love that one scene. And I guess if I had to pick, if I had to nitpick, like, maybe, like, a weak scene, this is just, like, more of a technical aspect. There's some editing that's a little weak, especially when the boat starts sinking. There's one shot where it looks like Roy Scheider should be in the water right now. The boat is sinking at such a high speed that he should be submerged right now. He should be, like, shooting the shark in the water, or if he even can. And then the next shot, it goes to the shark swimming towards him. And then the next shot, the boat's doing pretty well even though it's sinking like it's like the boat just kind of rose back to the surface that's just me being nitpicky just a, a few editing things that just went a little yeah, a little that. whacked out that the only thing that really kind of took me out in terms of like being just a little weak it's just some of the editing the technicality but that you could argue that's the production but um it just kind of took me a little bit but yeah there's that one scene where like the, the boat is on fire and they're under attack by the shark it just so much happens in just 30 seconds of film and it's like my best part, my favorite part of the movie. Nice. So, you get a takeaway from it. Takeaway: um, This movie terrified people from going into the water for many years, including myself. And it, like we said before, this movie still holds up because of the practicality and because of the uh, um, what they were trying to do on film. I mean, Steven Spielberg directed the shit out of this movie. I mean, he really put so much detail and so much of everything into this movie and it flows it paces beautifully you can watch at any point and there's a reason why he is the master of cinema even to this day he's still making great films most directors would have aged out or tired out by now but he's getting with the times still making movies with great production value and great special effects and good performances finding all these nuances there's a reason why he's the master of cinema I agree. Yeah. Jeff, you want to go? This is going to be a hard one because there's actually a couple scenes I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. But the one that actually stands out the most for me is when they're sitting on the beach right after the initial attacks. Mm -hmm. And um, you're watching, he's watching the water, he's watching his kids play. And all of a sudden, that one kid on the raft gets attacked. Uh, what's his name? Alex Kinger? Klinger? Kintner. Kintner. <laughs> and you just see the oh shit look on his face and the camera's actually oh yeah where well, they do the yeah. they they do the like the zoom out and the dolly in yeah, and that, and that, yeah. yeah. that yeah. scene to me right there is like the most intense because he's like he's been fighting the mayor and everyone to like, shut this fucking beach all down yeah and then all of a sudden this happens and it's like oh fuck what am i gonna do oh no yeah yeah that was like that was the one scene that always got me because like watching the whole thing like come in and then because <laughs> they didn't see it before yeah you know he he knew about it he had an idea and now he had a First, you know, like, boom, it's right in front of me, and it gives you that really queasy... That's actually a Hitchcock trick where they zoom out and dolly in and mm -hmm. give you that yeah. weird effect. But the two other honorable mentions are when, um, right after all that shit happens, he's looking through the books of the sharks, and he's talking to his wife about uh, where the boys are at. Well, he goes, she's in, he's sitting in his boat, it's time to the dock. He goes... Run out there, get the fuck out of the boat! Yeah. And the mom's sitting there, and she has just to flip through a page where there's a shark busting through a boat now, and she's like, uh, You get the. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to your father! Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's, a co there's that comedy scene. Uh -huh. And then the last one is the shot when the orca's going out of the bay, it's through the um, window, and actually goes through the shark's teeth, the boat is. I'm like, That yes. shot right there mm -hmm. is okay. so memorable. Yes. I'm like, It's probably like one of the coolest shots that they put in the movie so I was like I wish they would have used it a little more often <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're so used to the picture of the shark why don't they just use that because you're getting both of them the orca and the mm -hmm. and least I, favorite scene honestly I really can't think of anything like there's not See, there much. really yeah. isn't there really isn't much I don't have to nitpick and I'm like I can't even nitpick I'm like gotta shrug my shoulders on this yeah. one <laughs> uh, what's your takeaway from it honestly just 
a really enjoyable movie. I, like I said, it stands out, but there's some dated stuff, but obviously it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I fucking love it. Okay, my favorite scene. Yeah. I gotta say, the one that, uh, like, I just stop and just go, I gotta watch this, is Quint's speech about the USS Indianapolis. Great scene. Because that's the one where it's it's so well lit. It's got this really nice music that it really takes you away from the the fact that they're out for the shark mm-hmm, and yeah. all the past stuff. It's like you finally get to know this crazy guy that they're on this adventure with. Mm-hmm. And part of you kind of has to say, like, like, can I get off this boat with this guy? Oh, yeah. You know, right. <laughs> he's, he, if he's in charge of this roller coaster, uh, maybe I made a mistake of <laughs> coming right. on here. <laughs> And then he, he's telling all the stories and how it's basically mentally scarred him. Oh, it has. That's, yeah. that's I can see why anyone would be drinking and, during this moment. And, and all the, the like the, the detailed description, like he knows, like he actually looked into the devil it, him, itself eyes, when dolls, yeah. eyes. His lifeless biting into you. Yeah. Like he knows how how these are. You know, these he knows how are. sharks operate and yeah. what their their goal is. <laughs> And how he's lost friends, he's lost comrades. Mm-hmm. Probably, you know, he's probably a soldier at one point and didn't know what he was going to do yeah. except be a soldier in his life. Mm-hmm. And now he's this fisherman that it's goes after his... sharks. It's yeah. almost like that was the start of a new mission for him in mm-hmm. life. Yeah. Yeah. Also looks like he came full circle after talking about the story about the sharks. And then, yeah, and then the he the, yeah. gets eaten by the shark. Yeah. And, and then even at the end of the scene when he's telling the whole story, he puts a smile back on his face and says, hey, well, we delivered the bomb and the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. And I got to say, you really got to mention some of the other classic scenes that stand out for favorites. The shark jumping up on the boat. You know, you, you, that's another scene that I think people got to stop and go, whoa. You know, it's just an incredible mm-hmm. scene. They can do that. That's how they get their prey. Mm-hmm. They'll jump out of the water and just their mass bringing the prey down, and, killing it on impact. And, oh, yeah. and seeing it in a movie and how Quint, Quint's struggling to to stay up on the boat and Brody can't save him. It, and then he's giving him a fight even though he's getting bitten in half. It's mm-hmm. He's going down swinging no matter what. Right. And with the mechanical shark and stuff, it's really something cool to look at. I'm sure it was something back then, because yeah. you know there was no CGI or better special effects to really uh, up the ante to try mm-hmm. to make it look better. That's right. and that's still legit looking. It is also it's also terrifying. Oh yeah, it's very terrifying. I mean, think about that as for an actor with the shark not working and how they said it would sink at the bottom. Like, what if that would drag him? Like the mouth would close. And, and then it would stop working as he goes under the water. I'd be and freaked out. Like, yeah, I'd be like, get I me out of here. Like, I'm not, I'm not acting anymore. Get me <laughs> out of here. <laughs> I mean, that, that was just, that's scary. I mean, when Roy Scheider's just staring the shark down when it's coming right at him, and the shark's the one that's coming at him. Yeah. And he's, sta- he's just on that mast with the gun shooting the shot. It's the biggest fuck yeah moment. Oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> And the shark just like slowly going down. You hear that dinosaur growl that they used for for duel when yeah. the truck goes down. It was mm-hmm. that same dinosaur growl that yeah. they said. Yeah, that was that was really cool. And the seagulls feast on its corpse. Yeah, the seagulls feast on its corpse. <laughs> there were a lot of seagulls too. They showed up out of nowhere. Like, oh, free meal. Yeah. Mine, 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 mine. mine. <laughs> Uh, as far as the least favorite scene goes, um, you know, I'm not really too crazy about the scene where Hooper was in the cage. I mean, it it was dramatic and suspenseful. When he was in the water or yeah, before he got in the water? When he was in the water. Okay. I was like, uh, you know, okay. I kind of liked the stuff of them on the boat. and I mean, the the shots were really cool. I think it was kind of a slow pacing thing, but without it, you wouldn't get the shark on the boat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Of course, another scene I think we should mention again is that you're going to need a bigger boat. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, the one liners again. I mean, it's just classic. I mean, you can quote that with anything. And, I mean, hell, it was in the 
the Ghostbusters movie that they re- Chris Hemsworth says it. I know. <laughs> One of the top 100 lines in cinema. Yep. Oh, easily. Easily. Um, uh, my takeaway from it is, um, yeah, the ocean is a dangerous place. It's really, like, consider the consequences. If you and, swim, proceed with caution. Yep. And even the water in general, too, not just oh, what's yeah. in it. Mm-hmm. But also, I got to say, the, the, the filmmaking as far as dealing with the ocean, dealing with it, like it, it's, it's a sign to filmmakers and studios in general to say, don't try to rush something because, yes, we got something really great out of it, mm-hmm. but could you imagine how possibly better Jaws could have been? I mean, don't get me wrong. It could have been worse if they showed more of the shark. Yeah, it, really it, would have, it would have taken away the suspense element. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but and it actually still could have wound up being a great movie. But if Jaws would have bombed, there would be no Steven Spielberg. There, his career would not be as yeah. explosive as it is now. I, I just think it's a a sign and a message that if you, when it comes to making a movie, make sure you got the technology down pat, and make sure you know what you're dealing with. Let practices let. Yeah, like I understand they were under the gun with, you know, the book was a hot commodity, so you want to strike while the iron's hot. Right. But, I mean, it, Jaws in the end could still be a good movie, but since it became a blockbuster, it's a major classic in cinema. Mm-hmm. I think it could possibly be a, a cult classic if it would have bombed, and if people would have discovered it on VHS or TV right. down the Rhine. Kind of like Shawshank Redemption, when no one saw that movie in theaters, and yeah. it became the biggest selling VHS in the nineties. There you go. Yeah, you know, I could see Jaws easily being that, but it could also be a huge miss, and people go, "Oh yeah, we didn't expect it to." You know, like it was, maybe we should have like given it more time and let them prep. Because I heard tech guys that were on the movie said if they would have given us more time, that shark would have been working. Yeah, we would have designed it better, made sure it had functions that mm-hmm. worked properly. Yeah. But Jaws is what it is. It's a fine piece of cinema. It's definitely a classic. I know it, it almost seems sacrilege every time you nitpick about it, but it is one of those things where, like I said earlier, I mean, they give the shark a personality like they it's do. human. Yeah. It's like, hey, I know you guys. Like, Brody's on the mast, and the shark is chomping at him like, hey, come on down here. I'm going to get you, bud. Mm-hmm. You know, I know there's three of you. It's like, dude, you can't even count. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but yes. You guys, have anything else to add? I think we've said no. what we needed to. It's pretty much not much else we can say. We like we got through it. We able like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we go. We survived. <laughs> <laughs> it's a piece of film history. It's a piece of pop culture history as well. It's a movie that film lovers should all see. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it's another one of those. What the fuck are you doing? What are you yeah, yeah, like, like, ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, you no. can skip the sequels. This is one of those deals where the first one matters. Just you can, watch the first one. You can skip the book, too. It's really not that much better. You, you know, you want the shark to kill everybody. And you really don't get a sense of fear or suspense from the book, either. So, the movie's the definitely... The better way to go with this, yeah, yeah absolutely agreed. And it jump started Steven Spielberg. It left us with some great memories, and mm-hmm. I gotta say too, like just, like I said before, the ride itself yeah. that was fun as hell. I missed the hell out of that ride. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and um, I still I, I still remember it even at five. I still remember that ride. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was at the edge of the boat when the son of a bitch popped up. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. You poop yourself? <laughs> I was shaking. My dad yeah. laughs at it to this day. He goes, oh yeah, you were shaking. I'm like, I was six years old. <laughs> you put me on the edge of the fucking boat with a great white shark coming up? I was like, yeah, thanks. It was a fake shark. Doesn't matter. I don't care. <laughs> that is the closest damn thing I ever want to get to a shark attack in my life. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. 
Well, hey, they said when that when they first came up with that ride, the ride didn't work properly either. And at one point, a dad fell off the boat to, oh at a God, part this... where the shark was getting ready to come. There's some symbolism right there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he shit his pants in the water. <laughs> I would have. I would have. I would have. <laughs> I really... I, and I, I do miss the practical effects more in movies. I mean, there is a... There, there is a nice mix of them nowadays where they yeah. they can kind of cope with CGI, some practical stuff, and it blends really well. I know Robert Rodriguez had actually done some early work with that, like in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Okay. And I think our technology will continue to be better. I am a little nervous that this is one of those movies that shouldn't be remade, but... Um, sh- they should never remake this movie. But ever. I'm pretty sure it's going to be talked about somewhere you should and never remake it. some way down the line they will and say hey well we got a shark that actually works and whatnot yeah but no. that's they're, they're gonna miss the point yeah if they remake I, this movie they're gonna miss the point about what made this one yeah, so great it, to me it's kind of like rocky where there's only certain actors and certain creative team members and the resources that you have that make this movie what it is yeah. you know a remake at this point would just be a cash cow. Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No, uh, yeah. I mean, some characters like James Bond, they can go on forever and change with the times, and it fits. You know, Batman, Superman are the same way. You know, there, there are just some things that you, you just don't touch. You don't. And if you do touch them, you better damn well make, make it, it good. Yeah. Have a reason to do it. Yeah. Yeah, don't just put money into it it's not money yeah you know, get talented guys and put faith in actually making a good product because yeah. otherwise you're just gonna fail hard you said hard <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> we took the steam out of it <laughs> anyway that concludes our show of jaws for the day Thank you all for listening. Yes, and thank you. thank you. Smile, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and in case if you all need some advice in life when things get you down, you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. See you. See you. Uh, please, somebody help me. <laughs>